Welcome back. What I want to do in this video is really sort of kick off the, the whole beta oxidation process. And really to understand beta oxidation, we first have to understand where the fat comes from. And, you know, fat can come from the diet, but a lot of the fat oxidation, um, it, 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 it ultimately begins in an adipocyte. So I have an adipocyte, right? So here's my adipocyte over here, and here's my adipocyte, right? And I have several enzymes, okay? Number one, I have this enzyme over here, ATGL, and this stands for adipose triacylglycerol lipase. And then I have another enzyme right here called hormone-sensitive lipase. And then I have another one called monoacyl glycerol lipase. And I drew them in this order, and you'll see why in a few minutes. But um, it turns out that they all three of them have different substrates, and we'll see as we go along. Okay? So I have those, and on the and this on the membrane of the adipocyte, I have these, these things called perilipins. So this is a perilipin, this is another perilipin, this is another perilipin. And so I have these things called perilipins, and on the perilipin, I have this protein. I have this protein called CG1. And actually, let me do this in a different color. I have this protein called CG1. CG1. Okay. And just just for note, the CG1 is on all of the perilipins. Okay. And then I have my plasma membrane, right? Here's my plasma membrane, right? And, the, and, the, and this lipid droplet, this is the lipid droplet right here. Lipid droplet, the lipid droplet. And this is all inside my adipocyte, okay? Now on the, on the membrane, I have a receptor, and this is a receptor for glucagon. Also on the membrane, I have, and let me do this in a different color, I have another enzyme, and this is called adenylyl cyclase, or adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase. And in the, sort of in the, the inside the cell, in the cytosol, I have another enzyme called protein kinase A. Okay, and it's and protein kinase A. Go ahead and box that. Protein kinase A is a phosphate donor, meaning it's a kinase. It's going to transfer. It's a transferase. It's going to transfer phosphates to different molecules. And as we'll see, uh, paralipins and hormone sensitive lipase are some of the targets. Now, essentially, what's going to happen is I'm going to have glucagon floating around here. So here's a glucagon. Glucagon. Go ahead and box or circle that. And glucagon is a molecule that stimulates the hydrolysis of fat. So in other words, if you have lots of glucagon in your blood, it probably means that you're low on energy and you need an energy source. So your body is going to hydrolyze the fat in your body to individual uh, uh, fatty acids, and then they're going to go through beta oxidation. So if you've got lots of glucagon present, that's going to happen. So glucagon is first going to bind to the receptor. It's going to bind to its corresponding receptor. And, and, and the glucagon receptor is a G protein receptor. So this is the G protein subunit. that is. So it's going to move over to the and activate the adenylate cyclase. So when glucagon binds, right, when glucagon binds, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, just ignore that. Um, when glucagon binds, the, the G protein alpha subunit is going to move along the membrane and it's going to activate adenylate cyclase. It's going to activate adenylate cyclase. Sorry, that's kind of annoying me. And when adenylate cyclase gets activated, it's going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. Into cyclic AMP. And I'll just come over here and draw that structure for you. It's a specific cyclic AMP. There are lots of cyclic AMPs. Um, it just depends on which one you're talking about. But the cyclic AMP that we're talking about looks 
like this. Looks like this. And of course you have your, your purine up here and of course it's going to be what? It's going to be adenine. So if we label this, you got your adenine right here. You got your ribose right here. And it, it, it's a, and the way we would name this would be, so here's the carbon one, two, three, four, five. So we would name this molecule, and let me do that in a different color. We would name it three prime, five prime, cyclic AMP or cyclic adenylate. And that's how we would name the molecule. So this is the cyclic AMP that's being formed by adenylate cyclase. And as you increase the amount of glucagon binding to the receptor, right, as you increase it, there's more and more cyclic AMP being produced. And there's more and more, of, and, and cyclic AMP is going to bind to and activate protein kinase A. So the more cyclic AMP you have, the more activation of protein kinase A you're going to have. So cyclic AMP is going to come over here and activate protein kinase A. Now, protein kinase A is going to come over here, right? And protein kinase A specifically phosphorylates uh, several proteins. Number one, it's going to phosphorylate the perilipins. So it's going to phosphorylate these guys. And we'll see what that does in a minute. And it's also going to activate hormone-sensitive lipase. And you can sort of picture hormone-sensitive lipase as bound in the membrane. So it's going to phosphorylate hormone-sensitive lipase, okay? Now this does two things. Number one, it activates hormone-sensitive lipase, right? It activates hormone-sensitive lipase, okay? But also there's another thing that it does, and when the perilipins, those little white uh, ovals, when they get uh, phosphorylated, the CG1 dissociates, right? The CG1 dissociates, and it sort of moves along the membrane and activates adipose triacylglycerol lipase. So what just happened? Protein kinase A got activated by cyclic AMP and it phosphorylated hormone-sensitive lipase and the perilipins, right? And so then what happens is the, the CG1 dissociates and activates adipose triacylglycerol lipase and the phosphorylation activates hormone-sensitive lipase. Now what I want to do first of all is I want to define exactly what these lipases are doing, okay? Um, and actually let me come down here and do this. Come down here. So if I have this, adipose triacylglycerol lipase, what that's doing is it's taking a triacylglycerol and converting it to a diacylglycerol, right? Does that make sense? So you're taking a triacylglycerol and you're converting it to a diacylglycerol, right? Then if I have, what's the next one? If I have hormone-sensitive lipase, right? I have hormone-sensitive lipase. That is going to convert diacylglycerols to, um, to monoacylglycerols right so come over here diacylglycerol to monoacylglycerol and then the last one is your monoacylglycerol hydrolase or monoacylglycerol lipase and this one is going to take the monoacylglycerol and completely hydrolase it, hydrolyze it so um, monoacylglycerol lipase converts monoacylglycerols to glycerol plus the fatty acid, right? And actually in all these cases, you end up with a free fatty acid, right? So that's the difference between these enzymes. And that's the reason I drew them in this order, right? The, the one on the top has the largest substrate, the one on the bottom has the smallest, right? Adipose triacylglycerol lipase hydrolyzes a fatty acid off of triacylglycerol. Hormone-sensitive lipase hydrolyzes fatty acid off of diacylglycerol. And monoacylglycerol lipase hydrolyzes a fatty acid off of monoacylglycerol. 
Okay, so they sort of descend in the order of their substrate, right? Well, what we should really do is we should really get to know, we should really get to know the mechanism of what's happening, right? We should get to know the mechanism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to come over here and... I'm just going to draw some generic R groups, right? And so this is your, this is basically your triacylglycerol, right? This is your triacylglycerol, right? Glycerol is a three carbon molecule, so I got, let me draw it in different color, one, two, three, so this is glycerol, and you have the individual ester bonds to the fatty acid, right? So what I want to do right now is I want to look at the mechanism, okay? And we're just going to, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to focus in directly so I don't have to draw the whole thing over and over again. I'm going to focus just on this part, okay? So what I'm going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at the mechanism briefly. So essentially what this enzyme is, is it is a serine hydrolase. It is a serine hydrolase. So a serine hydrolase is essentially, um, it's essentially a hydrolase that first does a nucleophilic acyl substitution using a serine. So if we were to look at exactly what it's doing, here's a serine and, and here is the hydroxyl group that's doing the nucleophilic attack, right? Do this actually let me do this in purple so there's my lone pair right initially what's going to happen is the electrons are going to hit this carbonyl carbon and it's going to kick these electrons up and so that's what you see here the electrons are right there here's the r group here's the serine attached and the tetrahedral intermediate right so we generated a tetrahedral intermediate the next step in this hydrolase mechanism is essentially, um, essentially these electrons kick back down, right? The electrons kick back down and they kick off the fatty acid, right? They kick off, excuse me, it's incorrect. No, they, don't, they kick, let me, let me do this over. They kick this off, right? they kick off the glycerol, right? So what you're left with is essentially, there's the R group of the fatty acid, the carbonyl and the serine, right? I hope this makes sense. Then the next step is the actual hydrolytic mechanism. So here's water, draw it in blue for water. Water is gonna come in, hit the electrophilic carbon, Pi bond kicks up, kicks back down, and kicks off the serine. So what you end up with is you regenerate the serine residue, right? And you end up with the fatty acid, right? There's my fatty acid. So what did we see? Well, the serine did a nucleophilic attack and generated a tetrahedral intermediate. And when the, the, the electrons kick back down, they kick off the glycerol, right? So this that I'm highlighting in orange, this right here is part of the glycerol, right? So that would be this part right there, right? That's what I'm talking about. It kicks off glycerol, and then we reform an acyl intermediate. So this is an acyl intermediate. And then water comes in, does a nucleophilic acyl substitution, and kicks off the serine regenerating a, or, or generating the fatty acid. And so what we've seen now is we've seen the mechanism of a serine hydrolase. And in fact, there are many, many serine hydrolases, uh, protein or proteases. Proteases are serine hydrolases, although they're hydrolyzing amides. But the mechanism is exactly the same. In fact, one enzyme that you may have heard of in the context of a physiology class is acetylcholinesterase, and it has the exact same mechanism. So these three enzymes right here all have this same mechanism. It's a serine hydrolase. 
And so they're all, their goal is to generate this guy, generate the fatty acid, right? Does that make sense? So if we go back up to this picture, right? When PKA, the protein kinase A, phosphorylated perilipin, the CG1 dissociated and activated um, adipose triacylglycerol lipase, and also the phosphorylation activated hormone sensitive lipase. Altogether, glucagon's effect is to cause the, the increase in the number of fatty acids. And so the fatty acids exit the adipocyte, right? The fatty acids exit the adipocyte. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let me come over here. The fatty acids exit the adipocyte, let me come over here, and they bind to a protein called albumin. Albumin is a major protein in the blood. And actually, if you think about it, fatty acids are very hydrophobic, right? They're large carbon chains. Blood is water. So fatty acids are not soluble in blood. So they have to have a solubilizing protein so they can travel in it, and albumin is that protein. So you're going to get a complex of albumin and the fatty acid. And essentially, this albumin is going to take the fatty acid to the cell. So it's going to take it to the cell, and it will basically uh, facilitate the transport of the fatty acid into the cell. So albumin will come back off and pick up more fat. So now we have the fatty acid in the cell, right? The fat is in the cell now, and now we can do really whatever we want to with it. And in the next video, what we'll see is that we're going to have to use a very special enzyme. It's a, it's a ligase, and we're going to have to ligate it to a coenzyme A. And the enzyme is called fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase, and this basically renders the fatty acid activated and ready for beta oxidation. So I hope this video helped, and really the whole point of this video is to show you ultimately how we get fats out of adipocytes and actually how we get them into the cells. And actually, this, this serine hydrolase mechanism right here, this is actually the same thing that you would see for lipases in the intestine. So if you were not, instead of, instead of hydrolyzing fats in, um, in adipocytes, if you were to get them in the diet, um, you would have these triacylglycerols in the, your intestines, and you would also see that the fats are hydrolyzed in this way as well. So you would get free fatty acids uptaken into the blood in chylomicrons, and it, it would be much of the, the same physiology. Ultimately, the fatty acids are going to end up inside the cell right here, and we're going to undergo beta oxidation on the fatty acids. So I hope this video helped. In the next video, we'll look at fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase. See you